Hello everybody! This is the long-awaited video with almost every big and small Red Dead creator I could find. Of course, their links will be found in the description, so I highly encourage you to check them out. I've been playing this game for a year and a half, but my knowledge of the game might seem like I've been playing it since day one. With this knowledge, I know of the mysteries in Red Dead Redemption 2 that have never been solved. Today, me and other creators will talk about the many unsolved mysteries of Red Dead Redemption 2. At these spots in Roanoke Ridge, there's two crash meteorites. One inside of a house that killed the people living in it, and one just up the hill. That one had a bigger blast, but the real mystery is that you can take a piece of these meteorites, and when you open up your satchel, it says carrying two out of three meteorites. Meaning that there is a third one in the game, but it's impossible to find. There are other theories that the missing meteorite is in GTA 5 or it's online, but those might not be related to the Red Dead meteors. It's also probably not something Rockstar accidentally added. The carrying two out of three meteorites is still in the game four years later, so I'm not sure. Hello everybody, it's Tensified. Waxy has somehow brought me back from the dead to share my findings on an unsolved mystery of my own. This one revolves around the Native American burial site found just north of Awanjia. Coming up to this place of the forest of West Elizabeth, we can find many horrors. Many skulls, animal and human, impaled on beams. Animal skins laid above the ground on scaffolding for no apparent reason. Rocks can be seen placed in an odd formation, where at the center of it can be found a stone hatchet. However, it's only available to those who got 25 kills with it in GTA Online. It's kind of immersion breaking in my opinion, but besides that, this location is quite haunting, or even a slight bit humorous considering the fact that this rock kind of looks like a dick. Amongst the ambience, an audio loop can be heard of what players think is a skinwalker or similar odd beast. along with clicking and cackling, and by lighting any of these structures ablaze will immediately change the weather to start raining, putting out any fires, along with hitting you with that dollar store honor loss. Lastly, this is something kind of tacked on, but for whatever reason in this location, you just cannot clean your guns. You have to get whatever distance away from it to do it, which honestly is kind of confusing why, but I figure I'd just throw it in. Ooh, spooky, you can't clean your gun. Diving into the game's code reveals that the audio is from a creature with no certain name. While I must warn you, at least for me, listening to these sounds alone at night with headphones on will genuinely freak you out. So, you have been warned. Have a listen to a few that I've handpicked. <sighs> Using a script monitor, we can see this script being run called Discoverable Indian Burial. As a person like myself, I'm actually not really good with going through code. However, from what I can tell, it looks like there's actually a few errors in it, like this one where an Indian chant was supposed to be heard. Here we can also see the coordinates of where a lightning strike is supposed to happen. This place can truly bother me because there isn't really any explanation as to why it's here, along with many other things in Red Dead Redemption, I understand. It's almost like this is actually just some sort of world building technique with no real answer. Overall, it is truly a spooky place for me to come across, as it was one of the first things that I ever found while first playing this game. Truly, it was a bone-chilling experience. Once again, thank you Waxy for having me on, and maybe I'll consider making some more content again soon. Breaking down the Ghost Train and Braithwaite Outhouse. What up goofies, Waxy invited me to talk about some Scoobies, so here we go. First up is the Ghost Train appearing near the old Greenback Mill. The train shows up alongside the tracks at around 3am. The train appears to be a single 3 car that whizzes by it before disappearing. This is a one time event and after experiencing it, it will never happen again in the same save. Now the origin of this train is unknown, but I have a theory. This train could be some sort of omen for something to come, similarly to the Flying Dutchman. Omen for what, I don't exactly know, it's not like there are many train accidents in Red Dead 2. It could also be simple world building, something Rockstar excels at. The train isn't anything too special, but this next one is. Gertrude Braithwaite is the name of this poor woman stuck in an outhouse. Cousin to Penelope Braithwaite, Gertrude is most likely the result of inbreeding. So Dutch wasn't too far off. You inbred trash! She's locked up to keep the Braithwaite name clean, as this is a pretty big scandal. When you want to keep your image as pristine as the Braithwaite, you probably wouldn't let your 
inbred relative be seen in public. She'll count sets of numbers before kind of jumbling her words and just giving up. Since she faces Butcher Creek, there's a theory that connects her to the outhouses. Checking the outhouses shows a pentagram and indeed, five outhouses. So Gertrude is somehow connected to Butcher Creek, whether through outhouse magic or demonic curses or possibly the Murphy Brood. Since she seems to be relatively healthy, it's possible she was locked up recently. Here's a theory inspired by Strange Man's video, check it out if you want way more info than I can provide here. Gertrude was a relatively normal girl, but she was kidnapped near Butcher Creek by the Murphy Brood. The Brood then did unspeakable things to her before her family found her again. This made her go crazy and thus resulted in her being locked up in the outhouse. There she counted away her days as by 1907 she was a bastard skelly. Quite the theory, but A, that's all I got for this video. Thanks to Waxy for inviting me on it. We can now move on to the next entry, which is not as good as mine, but still, enjoy. Greetings everyone, my name is Fishy, and yes, you have been pronouncing my name wrong. And as my contribution to Waxy's collaborative project, I've chosen the Red Dead Redemption 2 mystery of the disappearance of the Blackwater Athletics team. A mystery that takes us to the southern portion of West Elizabeth, and its implications are quite fascinating. As you can imagine, our investigation begins within the town of Blackwater. It's here where you can reliably find editions of the Blackwater Ledger, and the article we are looking for can be found within the Blackwater Ledger number 69. Nice. The article reads as follows. Blackwater Athletics Team Missing. Friends fear they have been foully dealt with. Members of the Blackwater Athletics Club are still missing and their friends and family are excited by the gravest fears. They were last seen leaving the north edge of town for a group athletics run and although the most thorough search has been made for them, they cannot be found. Certain facts around their disappearance have given cause for suspicion. The affair has created a sensation in Blackwater and the surrounding community. They had departed on a run and had intended to return the same evening. Their friends are making a diligent search, and police in neighbouring areas have been notified. At first, there were rumours they had been kidnapped by Indians. However, this appears to be false, as no tribes have engaged in theft of livestock or kidnapping in some years. The Blackwater Athletics team were training for a competitive meet next month, and were expected to take top honours in fencing, wrestling, and baseball. So, to summarise, the Blackwater Athletics team took off on a run one evening in 1899 and never returned. So where did these guys go? Fortunately, we as the player can solve that mystery, but it only leads to more questions. Our search for answers lead us to the Tall Trees region. It's at this spot on the map specifically where we will make a rather disturbing discovery. The remains of lots of men in athletic clothing. Sporting the letter B on their shirts, the implication is very obvious. This is the Blackwater Athletics team. The reason they never returned is because they died. The presence of bags on the heads of some of the athletics team, restraints on the others, and the letter B made out of mutilated human limbs it's very obvious that they had a fall, a terrible accident. It's very obvious that foul play was involved. So this leads to several questions. Who could overpower and kill a large group of athletic burly men? Considering their location within Tall Trees, the ravenous gang of the Skinner brothers would be an obvious guess. However, it cannot be them because the athletics team went missing in 1899 and the Skinner brothers weren't active in the region at that time. Though the open world is framed in a way that visiting this location isn't practical until 1907, so the rate of decay on the bodies is inconsistent with 8 years and more looks like a few months at best. I'm no expert, but I can only imagine the bodies would be far more worn had they been exposed for years. This is likely an oversight due to cut content such as Arthur Morgan in New Austin and things like that, which would give him access at some point in the story to the region between where he is and New Austin. So I'm going to run with the assumption that these poor fellas were killed around the time that they disappeared in 1899, and the letter B made from one mutilated leg and two mutilated arms 
is the ace in the hole here, as the same thing can be found in the basement layer filled with trophies of the serial killer Edmund Lowry Jr. from the American Dream side mission, along with newspaper clippings indicating that he's responsible for many, many more murders than the three that side mission highlights. And according to these, one of his many stalking grounds is indeed West Elizabeth. And this is the best presented theory for who could be behind the murders of the Blackwater Athletics team. However, it raises questions within itself. How did this scrawny single man, who doesn't have accomplices, manage to overpower an entire team of athletes? Even though the evidence implying that Edmund Lowry Jr. is indeed responsible is intense, it adds up all the way to trying to figure out how he pulled it off. Did he drug them, and then somehow kill them one by one? If so, it's surprising that none managed to escape. Or is this man just smoking things that no mortal should smoke? So though one could argue the mystery of the demise of the Blackwater athletics team has been solved, the circumstances that led them to a mass grave are yet to be uncovered and probably never will be. And with that concluded, subscribe to Waxy, he's a sound guy. I'll be watching. Thanks again for letting me be a part of this Waxy. Cinnabit. I hope everybody is enjoying the video so far. A lot of effort went into making this, so please consider subscribing. Anyway, in Red Dead Redemption 1, we can find a broken down steamboat called the Serendipity. Through campfire interactions, it's speculated in game that the boat crashed into the Mexican border and then some bandits jumped on to rob it. Or the captain of the boat cheated on his wife, resulting in the boat being cursed. You ever hear the old timers talk about the wreck of the Serendipity? Said that boat was cursed by a woman who had been cheated on. Her husband, the captain, died in a terrible way. It's still cursed. Many people theorize that this is the Blackwater boat from Red Dead 2, but that's simply not the truth because the Blackwater boat was a side wheeler. The Serendipity, sorry for the weird pronunciation, is a stern wheeler. An interesting fact I haven't seen anyone talk about is the Serendipity comes from a place called Tehula Jetty. From the leaked map of Red Dead Redemption 2 before the game's release, Tehula Jetty was originally going to be a location, but it was either cut or renamed to Van Horn. This is just speculation, but it's possible we could have seen the serendipity in our glory days if Tehula Jetty wasn't cut from the game. Thank you, Waxy, for having us on. By the way, Waxy, I, uh, I left my underwear at your house last night. <laughs> I'll be there later to come pick them up. Anyways, uh, <clears throat> the unsolved mystery we will be discussing today is about a sad lonely man who wanders aimlessly around the map of Red Dead Redemption 2. From San Denis to Blackwater, this man wanders around in search of his missing friend. This man is Nigel. Nigel, and an Englishman from Maidenhead, Berkshire, left his home country in hopes of chasing the American dream. He left with a man that he knew named Gavin. That leads us into the mystery. Nigel can be found in several different locations across the world of Red Dead Redemption, and he is looking for his friend, Gavin. He can first be found when playing as Arthur. He's dressed in formal clothing and seems to have only been searching for Gavin for a small amount of time. Fast forward eight years later, and you can still find Nigel as John. He's wearing the same clothes, but now they're much dirtier, and Nigel's also sporting a weathered look on his face. This shows that he spent the last eight years of his life only looking for Gavin. So who is Gavin? There are quite a few theories that we could go over for this, uh, one of them being that Nigel could suffer from a mental disorder called Dissociative Identity Disorder, which is essentially split personality. And the word is that one day Nigel woke up and no longer had this other personality, so now he's gone looking for him because he believes Gavin was real. Uh, something that might support this is a voice line from Nigel saying this. <laughs> I can't um... I can't remember what he looks like. <laughs> I'm looking for him, but I don't know who he is. I'm sorry to hear that. But there's a little bit more lore to the story we can grab to further analyze who Gavin might have been. There are plenty more voice lines from Nigel that tell us a little more backstory on Gavin. From what Nigel tells us, he came to America with Gavin and one day Nigel woke up and Gavin wasn't there. Now if we hogtie Nigel and loot him, he carries a letter from a man named Tom. The letter shows us that Tom does in fact know who Gavin is, as well as Gavin's mother, heading towards the idea that Gavin is a real person. However, there is also interesting details in this letter that one might miss. Uh, one of which being Tom saying that Nigel would pretend to be a Londoner to mess with a group of Scottish men. And another about how Tom ran into a guy who knew who Nigel was, but he talked about how odd he is. 
but this is just one person so we can't be sure. But who knows, maybe this Tom person is also just a personality of Nigel's. But as of 2023, the search for Gavin continues and he will more than likely never be found. Uh, but that concludes the mystery of Gavin. Uh, thank you again Waxy for bringing us on. We are Zonkers, we make Red Dead videos just like this, so if that's what you're interested in, come on and stop by and uh, have a good one everybody. Hello everybody, I'm Snook, and my entry is the Blackwater Aztec Code. This code and the writings along with it are some of the most mysterious and least known things in all of Red Dead Redemption 2. This secret also correlates to Red Dead Redemption 1 as well, so this secret crosses in between the two games, and possibly gives us hope for Red Dead Redemption 2 Undead Nightmare, but as we all know, that's a reach. Blackwater has all of these different symbols and hieroglyphs hidden around the town. Here's where you can find them. Look for symbols in the pass-through tunnel near Main Street. You'll find them between the Blackwater Saloon and Mrs. Wilson's Sweet Shops. On the roof of the Grain and Field Building, which is right across from the post office, you'll discover another set of symbols. Head to the Dead End Alleyway in the southeast corner of the town and you'll stumble upon yet another symbol waiting to be found there. Finally, make your way to Blackwater Pier's north side. There you'll spot the last symbol on a pylon. These symbols that are found throughout the city allegedly translate to Blessed are the peacemakers, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce that, but I guess this is the way you pronounce it. Aotead. Shout out Siri. And the name of that is the name of an Aztec god that caused the plague of the original Red Dead Redemption's Undead Nightmare to occur. And Blessed are the peacemakers is what is written on John Marston's grave at the end of the original game. So that is about all we know and possibly gives us hope to a Red Dead Redemption 2 Undead Nightmare, but that's probably not happening. And shout out to Waxy for bringing me into the video. Peace, and on to the next entry. Hello everybody, my name is Markiplier, and Waxy has invited me on to talk about the Man-Made Mutant. You can discover the Man-Made Mutant west of Van Horn in a tiny homestead, in fact, it's the same homestead you meet Bill and Micah at for the mission, The Delights of Van Horn. On the second floor of this home, the grotesque creation can be found. Its mere presence and the clues surrounding it have sparked numerous theories about its origin and purpose. The key to understanding the man-made mutant lies in the four experiment notes, which can be found within the house. Each note provides some insight into the creature's composition and the intentions of its creator. The notes describe a meticulous experiment combining various animal parts such as a boar, human, vulture wings, and a bear heart. The detailed descriptions make it clear that the creation was not just an accident. Weirdly though, the experiment notes do not mention all the animal parts present, like the ram horns, alligator arms, bear paws, cougar torso, and the arms still attached, and the black bear legs, which raises intriguing questions about the extent of the creature's hybridization. To understand the context of the man-made mutant, we must first explore the scientific and cultural influences on the late 19th century. Could this creation be a nod to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein? So, I should have made a woman so I could have sex with a corpse? I don't know, man. You just shouldn't have made a guy or a homage to the era's fascination with experimentation. One theory suggests the man-made mutant was the result of an Italian scientist's ambitious experiment. Inspired by the scientific breakthroughs of his time, the scientist may have sought out to push the boundaries of his creation and unlock the secrets of life. Another theory proposes that the mutant is a playful reference to popular culture particularly South Park's Man Bear Pig. Man Bear Pig, Man Bear Pig, you sound like your freaking grandpa. This fictional creature serves a satirical representation of environmental concerns. Could the inclusion of the mutant be a subtle nod by the game developers? As players dive deeper into Red Dead Redemption's open world, the Mad Made Mutant stands out as a testament to the game's attention to detail and its ability to create mysteries with great untold storylines. It sparks us to explore more and more mysteries and uncover more and more hidden stories that the developers hid for the most dedicated players. Or the players with an internet connection, but whatever. 
Seems better to just say it that way, okay? Okay? Hello, John. John Marston. Do I know you? I hope so. I seem to know you. The Strange Man, undeniably the most interesting and strange Red Dead mystery. What's up, guys? My name is Nick Parr, and in this portion, I'm going to go over briefly about the Strange Man mystery and Red Dead 1 and 2, and kind of give my overall thoughts on this character and explain who he actually is, and bring up an interesting theory on who I think he is. Let's start off by explaining his role in Red Dead Redemption 2. In this game, we don't ever really get to see him physically, but there's a lot of effect that he has in this game, such as we see his house, and lots of strangers talk about him, calling him the man in the top hat and the dark suit. In the swamp, there's a strange cabin that you can enter. Inside the home, there are a bunch of unfinished paintings and weird writings all over the wall. From the snow to the cave, being a reference to when we started out the story and where we end it. The water is black with venom, referencing the Blackwater Heist at the beginning of the game. However, there is one writing that changes on how you play the story. In Chapter 2, if you decide to kill or save Jimmy Brooks and Valentine, if you save Jimmy, it'll say, quote, There was a man called Jimmy Brooks who was always running into crooks, so one chased him down and he had to talk his way around. That Jimmy isn't dumb as he looks, close quote. But if you kill Jimmy, the writing will say, quote, there was a man called Jimmy Brooks, who was always running into crooks, but the man from the ferry found him far too contrary. Now Jimmy's family don't see him very much. Close quote. What I find very interesting is that it seems like the strange man knows everything about the gang. He constantly hints at their life events in his writings. If you keep coming back to the cabin, the paintings will get closer and closer to being done. Eventually, when the main painting is complete, you'll see that the strange man is revealed, and if you look in the mirror, you will see that the man is looking right at you, as a reminder that he's always watching. There's much more to see in The Strange Man uh, in Red Dead 2, such as Armadillo and the deal with the shop owner, but I won't really get into that in this video. And uh, moving on to Red Dead Redemption 1, in a random encounter, John finds a strange man in the middle of nowhere. He tells him that he knows him and he brings him Heidi McCourt, which was the woman that Dutch killed during the Blackwater Heist years back. Throughout these missions, he sends John to help people, and it's up to the player if John does the honorable or dishonorable choice, both of which have no overall importance. And at the end of The Strange Man encounters, John Marston once again asked him for his name, he responds he doesn't remember. In a fit of frustration, John shoots him three times, but the bullets don't affect him. Then he fades off into the distance. And this is the last ever time we get anything from this man. So what did it all mean? Who was this guy after all? Most people in the Red Dead community have theorized that the man is a supernatural of some kind, maybe the devil or the Grim Reaper himself. This could be why he knows so much about John and why he doesn't die. But one thing that doesn't explain all this is the connection to John and Arthur. Even though you can write off this character as being a demon from hell or the devil in disguise, I believe there is more to this character. Why is he so obsessed with these two people? He had his whole house in quotes and writings referencing their lives and how come he knows so much about these characters. After thinking about all this, I've come up with an interesting theory which kind of explains all this. I believe the strange man is a ghost from the past. I believe the man was an actual real person and he was an accountant. I believe he was killed by the Vanderland gang way back in the day during a past heist. And now he haunts and watches over those who murder him. This could explain why he referenced the Blackwater Heist during John and his first encounter, and how come John doesn't remember him, because it was so long ago. And why the strange man is so obsessed with John and how he knows him so well. He has been watching this whole time, seeing what the gang that killed him has been up to. And this could also explain why he tests both John and Arthur. He was testing Arthur by the encounter with Jimmy in Chapter 2, and John with the man at Thief's Landing, and the nun at the church, to test if they actually changed and have become better people. And maybe, even perhaps, he did this with every single gang member. Possibly even Micah, Dutch, Sadie, and more. But that's my take. Do you agree? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you all for watching this segment of the video. If you guys want to go check out my YouTube channel where I talk about more Red Dead and GTA 5 and other stuff, uh, go check out everyone else's YouTube channel. We all worked very hard on this video and all these people did a great job. Uh, thanks again and I'll see you soon.
The Strange Man is a mysterious character that appears in Red Dead Redemption 1 and can also make a few cameo appearances in Red Dead Redemption 2. He's sort of a Grim Reaper character, he knows everything about John and will send him on missions that will test him. The Strange Man is one of the most infamous Red Dead mysteries because we don't know much about this character except for the fact that his dialogue heavily implies that he is death itself. But you guys already knew that, so to try and bring something new to the table, I'm going to talk about a theory of who the Strange Man might actually be. Because I think the Strange Man might actually be Cain from the Bible, the first killer in history. After disobeying God and being banished from the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had two kids, Cain and Abel. Abel grew up to be a shepherd, while his brother Cain became a farmer. On one faithful day, Cain and Abel were asked to give offerings to God. Abel offered one of his best lambs, while Cain offered some vegetables. However, God was not pleased with Cain's offering because Cain was not doing it with the best intentions. Cain grew jealous of his brother and started to despise him to the point where he actually took Abel's life. This would end up becoming the first human murder in history. After killing his brother, Cain would be confronted by God. Cain would then be cursed to wander the earth for the rest of his life as punishment for what he did to Abel. But before Cain would go on to wander the earth, Cain was worried that he would be killed by other people after they would find out what he did to Abel. So he asked God, what am I going to do? People are going to kill me. God told Cain, if anyone tries to kill you, they will receive seven times the punishment. But what does all of this have to do with the strange man? Well, my theory is that Cain is actually the strange man and was not only cursed to wander the earth for the rest of his life, but was also cursed to be the Grim Reaper. Wouldn't it make sense for the first killer in history to be chosen as the Grim Reaper? When asked about his name, the strange man says this. What's your name? You know, it's the darndest thing. I can't remember. After thousands of years of wandering the earth, it wouldn't surprise me if you couldn't remember your name. But by far the biggest piece of evidence we have is at the end of the last strange man mission. At the end of this mission, John shoots the strange man three times, but the strange man is totally unfazed. God told Cain that if anyone tried to hurt him, they would receive seven times the punishment, and John shot him three times. Three times seven is twenty-one, the same amount of times that John is shot at the end of Red Dead Redemption. So does this mean that Cain is actually the strange man? Probably not. This is a very interesting theory, but I don't think there's enough evidence to back it up. It wouldn't surprise me though if some of the people at Rockstar actually intended it to be this way. It just seems like the kind of thing that the people at Rockstar would come up with. The strange man not remembering his name isn't really concrete evidence, and it is very hard to tell how many times John was actually shot. It's roughly 21 times, but it's very hard to tell. While I think this is an extremely interesting theory, I have to say that there's just not enough evidence to back it up, and it probably isn't true. The strange man is probably just the Grim Reaper or death of some kind. It's He's not Kane. He's probably not Kane. But that's one of my favorite things about Red Dead Redemption. There are so many amazing unsolved mysteries, and you can really just interpret them any way you want, and there are so many theories for each mystery. This segment of the video is brought to you guys by Lagging Leland. Thank you all so much for watching my segment, and make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Make sure to subscribe to everyone else who worked on this video as well, all these other amazing creators. Thank you so much to Waxy for providing the opportunity to collab with so many other Red Dead YouTubers. God bless you guys, and enjoy the rest of the video. One thing gamers love to do in the open world of Red Dead Redemption 2 is explore. And for those who roam the area of roads, or more specifically, South Shield Flats, they can discover something that may both shock and appall them. Robard Farm Upon the porch is a blood trail leading to the inside of the home, where both a man and a lady lay dead, meeting an apparent gruesome end. The broken plates, spilled drinks, and general upheaval of the property point to signs of a struggle. Inspecting the victims more closely, you can see that the two have had their bones broken. 
The lady, aside from the obvious signs of horrific violence, appears to have perished by a bullet wound straight to the forehead. By their positions in the room, with the man laying on the floor and the lady on her bed, it seems that the pair were caught by surprise. Was this a burglary gone wrong, possibly by one of the local gangs, or is there something more to this tragedy? There was something I hadn't quite investigated just yet, the blood trail. Heading back to the porch outside, I followed the trail to the rear of the property, only to discover that there was indeed a third victim. Pressed upon a cart with a revolver to her left and a machete to her right, lay the remains of a female. On her person, I found a letter giving us insight to the massacre at Robart Farm, which I'll leave on screen for a moment for those wishing to pause and read through. To summarise, the letter was written by Claude, our male victim, and addressed to Annette, our female victim, at the cart. The contents reveal that Claude and Annette were having an affair, as the man had a wife, the bedridden victim, Harriet. Although the married man tried to break it off, Annette was having none of it, and in a crime of passion, slaughtered her lover and his bride, before taking her own life by gunshot. This may feel like an open and closed case, but there's one or two things that didn't quite make sense. Claude was an average sized gentleman, and his secret lover, Annette, was only very petite. So just how did she manage to get the jump on both him and his wife? She was outnumbered and outmatched. Was Annette really working alone? The land to the rear of the farm may help us with our questions. A lit campfire surrounded by sitting logs indicates recent activity, and the two empty bowls of food show us that there was more than one person here. Did Annette and her accomplice wait until dark before launching the attack on the married couple? We know of Annette's reasons, but what of her partners? Here's what I believe may have happened. Annette wasn't a young teen. We can see this by closely inspecting her facial features, so more than likely she was married too. She may have convinced her husband to join her in attacking Claude and Harriet, fabricating some sort of reasoning. As Claude had momentarily left the home, possibly to use the outhouse, Annette snuck inside and fired at a sleeping Harriet. Startled by the sound of gunfire coming from his home, Claude would rush back inside to see his secret lover stood over the remains of his wife. Following him inside was Annette's husband, who would then slaughter his rival with a machete. Annette would then take the bladed weapon and viciously attack her rival, so to speak. But one question remains, why was Annette found dead herself? Whatever excuse Annette gave her husband, he may have seen the rage when she sliced at Harriet and figured there was more to the story than he was aware of. He possibly discovered the contents of the letter from Claude, confirming his new suspicions before taking the life of Annette and planting the evidence to her side. This would explain very well why the gunshot wound to Annette was through the forehead and not to the temple, as would be a more common method of people who chose to end their lives. What do you believe was the real story behind the tragedy of Robard Farm? Is there more to this than meets the eye? If you made it this far, thank you. Of course, go check out all the careers that were in this video. If you are a YouTuber and would want to be in a video or to do an interview on my side channel Lunacast, message me on Discord and we'll set something up. I would love to have you as long as you have interesting things to talk about. Besides that, have a wonderful day.